welcome everybody and welcome back to those um, who joined us last time to the Confident Kids and Positive Parents webinar hosted by Mary Health as part of the Be Mary Health and Wellbeing Week and delivered by the amazing Dr. Dita Kimba. Um, I'm really pleased you have joined us today and I hope there are a few people that um, are new today as well, because we had a higher number of registrations for this one. So I'm Anna, I'm the Community Engagement Advisor here at Mary Health, um, and I use the pronouns she, her. But before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and, and custodians of the land on which we meet today. I'm up on Wurundjeri Roy Wurrung people's land here in Faulkner, where I live, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Also noting that sovereignty has never ceded, I would like to extend my respect to anyone who identifies as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander in this webinar today. And those who were there on Monday, the beauty of online meetings, and I like to do that for all my online meetings um, or webinars in this case, is that we cut across different regions. So I would like to invite you to um, acknowledge the tr traditional honors of the land you sit on today. And you can use the chat function for that, please. So thanks for those who attended Monday's webinar. That was all about tracking our own stress. And I definitely had a little bit of stress in the last few weeks and have done a little bit of breathing exercise. Um, not as much as I should have probably, but I did. Um, so Monday was all about um, taking care of ourselves and um, Today will be more taking care of our children through cuddles and play, I believe. Um, if you've missed Monday's webinar, as we just discussed before, for those people joining us late, this will not impact your ability to participate today. And you will be able to get access to the video recording of last uh, of Monday. And for those who haven't received an activity book either, um, that will be sent out to you. So those should be the people that probably have joined within the or registered within the last 24 hours. So just some quick housekeeping, just similar to Monday. Um, we are recording this session to make it available on demand. Um, we prefer to use the chat function for questions and Dita is happy to take questions throughout this, this webinar. So keep asking away. Um, the chat function is at the bottom. There's a little three at the moment. Um, so there must have been three people chatting there at the moment. And Dita asked me to take um, track of her time. So I will be interrupting around the 30 and 45 minute mark to make sure that we have enough time for questions towards the end. Hopefully we won't have any technical difficulties. Last webinar went smoothly, although the practice round didn't go so smoothly. So if things are not going the way they're meant to be going, please take it with a smile and we will try to get everything up and running as soon as possible. So I will keep it short today because um, Dita informed me that we will be going through a lot. So I'm very happy to welcome back Dr. Dita Kimba. Um, Dr. Dita Kimba is a child, adolescent and adult psychiatrist who works in some of Australia's hardest to get places, including remote indigenous communities, and regional centers and adult and juvenile prisons. I will let take Dieter over from here now um, and we'll just keep track of your questions that are popping up and you will see my video go on and off. Um, and that means that I'll be ready to ask a question on your behalf. I will not use your names because we're recording and therefore um, we're keeping everything anonymous. So over to you Dieter, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and it's lovely to be back. Uh, it, the enthusiasm on Monday was really terrific. And it sounds like you're inhaling this information. Um, today we're talking, so on Monday we talked about stress. We'll do a quick recap of that. And then I had some prompts in the workbook, which some of you don't have yet, but you'll, you'll be able to get access. So it was really learning to track your stress so that you can control it and breathing. And we'll go over that. And today we're talking about connecting with our kids. 
And so I imagine we're all parents here or we've got lots of parents here. Certainly in my family, I've got a couple of kids and my husband and I um, are very much involved with raising them 50-50. Uh, so even though I talk about me, mum, that's because I'm a woman, but I acknowledge that there's a lot of wonderful dads doing really fantastic parenting work. So take the gender stuff as my gender and just apply your gender to it when we talk about it. Okay, so I'm going to, what I do is I do, I go like the clappers and um, share screen because I find talking with pictures makes things a heck of a lot easier. So let me just check, do present. Okay, so talk one was talking about stress and how can we track it so we can be relaxed. And so day one, it was, I talked about me getting stressed and how could I recognize my own signature signs? And so we came up with seven things, which is what do I feel or do that tells me I'm stressed? What do I think that tells me I'm stressed? What are the common triggers? Um, breathing to calm down. How do I feel safe to calm down? And then when I'm thinking better, how do I fix the problem that triggered me? And next time, is there a physical warning sign that I can notice that... Um, I can kind of take track of. Now, the reason we're looking for these physical warning signs is it's natural when we get stressed that we go from being aware of ourselves to aware of the problem. And so we lose that ability to catch ourselves getting stressed until the horse is kind of bolted. So here's my stress response pattern. The first thing I do and feel when I was talking about it last night is I start sort of running around like a headless chook and I feel very worried. The kind of things I think are very negative, like you shit, you'll stuff up, excuse my language, and my focus scatters. So that's evidence that my brain's turned off. The kind of triggers that I had the other day was too many deadlines, but I think we're all multitasking a lot of the time. And so the breathing that would bring me down was four counts in, six counts out, so that we're hacking into the nervous system and the braking system, the parasympathetic nervous system. I also had to feel safe to calm down, so protected, cared for, understood, and like I belong. And how could I tell when I actually had calmed down? Well, my thinking changed. So suddenly I could think straight that my kind of, I could understand what people were saying. I could articulate what I was worried about. And my planning head and my kind of rational head had turned back on. And finally, whoops, finally, um, what were the signs? Well, when I, when I get very stressed, I'm like this. But if I walk it back, just before that, I get quite irritable. And before that, the first sign that I'm not happy, Jan, is probably getting a bit restless. Now, as you start to get better at tracking your stress, initially we catch the 10 out of 10 stress, but I want you to start noticing what happened just before that and start walking it back so we can not only catch the late signs of stress, but catch the um, middle and even the early signs of stress so that we're bringing it down. And why do we want to bring it down? Well, uh, anxiety and stress is paralyzing. It turns our head off and we lose our best weapon. And so what I want you to do is to be calm. So whatever it was that overloaded you, you've got your best brain working and you can fix it. And so uh, for day two, it was breathing and heart rate. And so I suggested that you download some breathing apps, that you practice diaphragmatic breathing, that you get your heart rate down and you could go to the website. This is all in the booklet if you haven't got it. And then we talked about resonant frequency breathing. So these, this is the optimal breathing to calm your nervous system as quickly as possible. There was also a chakra breathing meditation. So just to recap on the breathing, this is the recipe or the prescription if you really want to calm your nervous system. So it's six breaths a minute. So that's 10 seconds of breath. Four counts in, six counts out. Do it for six minutes. So that's really how long it takes to do a full-on reset from a 10 out of 10 freak out. Now, if you're just getting a bit nervous, you can probably bring it down a lot faster. But if we know the outbound sort of um, level. So I'm hoping that you try this on day two. 
And why? Because it gives you control, doesn't it? And once we've got control, then we're master of our own destiny somewhat. Okay, now I have to interrupt this broadcast for a rant. And the rant is about multitasking anxiety. Whether you're a man or woman, if you find the reason you're getting anxious is because you're doing a gazillion things, then I want you to double check why. Who else? Who else's work are you doing? Because I don't see the point of calming down <laughs> so that you just end up, you know, being chief cook and bottle washer. And um, for me, um, my journey with multitasking is, you know, this sort of baked in idea that if you're humble and pure of heart and work your fingers to the bone, you will get rewarded. And um, my answer to that is, um, hang on, sorry, here we go. Um, so who's the scam artist that takes the credit for all the work I do? And I don't find I get rewarded when I'm doing all the extra work that everyone else is putting on me. So they wander around and say, if you want something done, ask a busy person. And then they come and ask me. And the, the minute I'm not useful, I get discarded. So no one, you never get credit for it or, you know, working credits or any kind of uh, help for that. And that's me working in the hospital system, you know, all the times you stay late and everything like that with, you know, fretting that the kids are back home. If you are getting chronically anxious because you are multitasking because someone else is not doing it, um, then watch out because if you do it for years and years, you end up like a bit of an empty shell of the person you were and that's not good for anyone. Okay, so I would like to suggest instead of Cinderella, a new role model. Okay, so that's Lizzo. She's my new role model. But if you're a bloke, find your favourite one too. But it's about saying back yourself, you know, Learn to say no if you're getting swamped and say yes to yourself. Because if you go down, the whole ship goes down and learn to delegate well. Now, unfortunately, I haven't learned how to do this yet, but I live in hope, even at 56. So you want to save your magic for the ones that you really care about. And the ones that I really care about are my kids. Okay, end of rant. So do we have any, I'll just start. Uh, Oops, I'll stop sharing for a second. Do we have any comments? Does anyone find themselves uh, feeling like they're multitasking sort of themselves into an absolute kind of level of distress? And um, please take heart from that. And I think we should all go and do a delegating course together. All right, share screen again. Let's press on, people. Um, here, share. There we go. Okay. So that's my little rant. We talked about day one and day two. Now let's talk about day three. So day three was about if we go into survival mode, if we get stressed and go into survival mode, fight, flight, or freeze, as a mammal, as a mammalian animal, it doesn't make sense for us to come out of survival mode and calm down if we don't feel safe. But you know, we're people that live with other people. It's not just a custodial safety. And we need to feel safe four ways. And that includes an attachment safety. And so the four ingredients of feeling safe are protected, cared for, understood, and like we belong. So it might, you know, if, if the person that was sort of humiliating you or upsetting you or the situation that was overloading you, you know, you get away from it, that might, you might feel protected from it, but you still need to connect with the people and feel cared for. You, you need to be understood and understand yourself and you need to feel like you can belong. And so I always pray see that as sort of four hearts. And really, once we feel safe, we're sort of a lot more secure. And again, this helps us think straight. Um, so I've already spoken about that. Now, in the workbook, we, we started thinking about, well, what is that? Oh, hang on. We're going on to day four. What was day four? Well, now we want to take these ideas. We want to take these ideas of how tracking stress, of uh, being able to breathe and being able to feel safe and say, well, how does that apply to our kids? And so 
if we can't control our own stress, how can we teach it to our kids? If we never got taught stress regulation, how do we know how to parent in an unstressed, unreactive way? And so this is why I always bang on about let's master it in ourselves first, because then we get a really embodied sense of stress regulation. And then we can teach it because we know it in our bones, just like we know what it's like to start riding a bike. And so if we're now thinking about our kids, like my kids are certainly finishing secondary school, but we need to um, teach our kids all the way along. So preschool, primary school and secondary school. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so this is where we come to connection and you're gonna see the link with stress and connection in a minute. But I want to expand on survival mode now. So on Monday, and this is the hardcore science we're doing, then we'll chill, chill a bit. On Monday, we talked about survival mode. So we knew about fight and flight, where you either feel angry or you feel scared. And that um, when we'll, we might see that in our kids too. And that we can also shut down to freeze where we feel more numb or empty or not there. But the big thing is that when we are in fight or flight, our brain's turned off. And the whole reason is this is an automatic hijack to make us stay alive to fight another day. But you know what? We're a pack animal. And so we don't just have one nervous system. We actually have two. So the second nervous system is the social engagement system. But we have to feel safe in order to engage with people. And just like we've got this sort of high energy version of fight and flight or this shut down sort of quiet version of, of freeze, in the social engagement system, we can either be calm and chill and be nurturing, or in the high energy version, we can sort of be happy and play. And this is where we heal and learn. And this is where our brain is turned on and we have language. So we can play together and we can communicate and we can teach our kids and we can help them feel secure. So we, we've really worked this system and now we're gonna think about this system. And the hard wired lever between the two systems is the breathing and the feeling safe. Okay, so here we've got three scenarios. We've got our stressed kid. We've got the kid that we're cuddling and we've got the child that's playing. And this is where we build connection. So when, when our child is young, they can't regulate their stress. We have to regulate it for them. But if we do a good, good job, then this is where they learn self-control. With the cuddles, this is the quiet time in the social engagement. This is the closeness. This is where our child becomes secure. And with the play, this is where they become confident. And really, you know, whether it's sort of your puppies playing or whether it's your kids playing or it's a horse frolicking in the paddock on a spring day, play is where we kind of, um, we experiment with our body and we experiment being with others and we experiment with our imagination. And so really it's a natural form of growing and we make mistakes, but they're play mistakes. And, and we sort of um, try out different versions of ourselves. So if we are connecting with our kids through all of these three states, so the survival mode state where we show them how to get control back, the cuddly state where we give them a sense of security and belonging and the play state where we sort of support them discovering the world and who they are, then this is where we increase our child's control, their sense of security and their confidence. It's as simple as that. Now, we'll start with this first. This is where if we've got a kid that's a bit anxious or if we um, have a kid that is sort of a bit insecure, it's the stress and the connecting with the stress and the cuddles that helps them heal. And it's through the play that they become confident. Okay, now, obviously my graphics are very gender oriented. So I've added in some board shorts for the dads stress or for the mums who like board shorts and I'm one of them okay now with stress kids will get stressed because it's too much or it's too hard or they're too tired but they're not coping because kids aren't born from an egg they're born from us 
And as a species, we have the most ridiculously long um, growing up. You know, it goes for like, I don't know, 15 years, 18 years. And the brain's not fully mature actually until 25. But obviously they're going to sort of separate and individuate around about that sort of, you know, 12 and onwards mark. And so um, what happens when the child get overwhelmed is that they get triggered. But guess what? So do we. So looking after a distressed kid, so mum or dad, if it's not mum, is very triggering and so if we get triggered and if we get into that brain turned off mode it's then extremely hard to calm them down so i've come up with the most basic parenting program which is take your own pulse first um, parenting and luckily you've already done part one so you're now good at calming yourself down because guess what you can't calm your child down if you can't calm yourself down and so this is how we connect we calm ourselves first so that we've got our thinking brain on and then we can help our child. And so how do we do this? Well, there's four basic steps. The first we learned on week one, which is you have to learn to track that you're getting stressed. Otherwise, the mouth runs away and all the damage is done. And once you track that you're stressed, you regulate in. And when you regulate in, brain turns on, impulsivity and emotionality subsides. And then we can, we can fix the problem and then we can help, help them belong. Now, here's the interesting thing. When, even though we've turned our brain on because we've regulated in, our child will not have a brain turned on. So how do we communicate with them, especially if they're lying like this in the supermarket next to the, the chocolate um, aisle? Well, they're in animal mode. So even though we're communicating with words and they're not really understanding them, they're still understanding our face, the music of our voice and our body language. So if we're like that and if we're kind of really frustrated, they're going to sort of read that. Whereas if we're, come on, come on, it's time to settle down. I know, I know you're getting really frustrated. So soft face, soft voice, soft body language even in that dysregulated survival mode state, that they are going to sort of read that communication that everything is all right and that we're going to help them. And that means then once they have regulated in, we might have helped them breathe, we might have soothed them um, physically, we might have comforted them, we might have picked them up, we might have rocked them. We're not going to, once they are calm, then we're going to fix the problem. And then... Um, because our thinking brain is working. And then we can get on with sort of the hug and the regrouping and joining back in. And so that's basically it. So it's sort of track, reset, fix, and then join back in. Now, what do we do about different age groups? Well, I've just made it as simple as I can. There's three sort of different categories. And obviously we're not hatched from an egg that we mature very, very slowly. We've got these complicated brains that we have to acquire knowledge and empathy and an emotional intelligence. And that just takes time. So where does our parenting come in with, you know, dealing with very different brains at very different ages? Well, the best way is to divide sort of development into three stages, preschool, primary school and secondary school. So basically in preschool, we do all the regulating. We track them. We regulate them in, we fix the problem, and then we make them feel like they belong because they're just a little googie gaga baby. And even if they're a little toddler running around, they just don't, you know, they just don't have that much brain. They really don't. Like <laughs> it takes a while to wire up. A lot of faculties aren't on board, so we need to be doing that. Now, primary school is interesting because really you've got quite a, fun a functional language by the time you come to primary school. But even as we drop our little darling off on day one of prep and sort of, you know, pull out the, the tissues, we, we don't just sort of leave them at school. We actually hand them over to the prep teacher because when they're OK, they can run around and do stuff. But the minute they, they get distressed, they need help. So in this middle phase of uh, childhood, it's, it's kind of an apprenticeship. It's like being the first year apprentice. So here we're looked after here that when we're going okay we can self-manage but the minute we're overwhelmed um, 
you know, we might track that we're upset or we might burst into tears, but then usually need a bit of help regulating and a bit of help fixing. And so we do it alongside the teacher. And this is where we learn about our body. And then finally, in secondary school, where there's that irresistible urge for independence, we don't tell our parents anything. And we gravitate to the peer group and the peer group are all trying to sort out each other's problems. And they don't tell the adults and they do a really, really bad job. And, um, you know, by the end of, by sort of middle or towards the end of teens, they're getting a bit better, but initially it's pretty atrocious. And so they, they are trying, what's happening is they're, they're kind of splitting off from their family and they have to learn to actually regulate their stress now by themselves. So, um, yeah. So hang on, let me just, we've sort of covered that. So really the whole, the whole idea with your kids is what age are they and what level of support do they need? And am, am I over-parenting or am I under-parenting? Like, like I need to meet them where their development's at. Now I'll just stop sharing for a second because that's a big mouthful. Do we have any sort of burning questions from that, Anna, or are people just sort of following it? Um, no questions yet, just some comments along the way. Would you yeah, like yeah. to hear those comments? Or no, no, that's all right. To... I feel guilty very often. Yeah, yeah. Well, welcome oh, to Parent one now. Yes. Yeah, welcome to Parent Kill. <laughs> so do I. And you know what's worse? I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, so when I'm stuffing up, I know what harm I'm doing, right? So you might be guilty, but, like, you know, I reckon... I don't know, I'll meet you and I'll raise you one is what I'm saying. I think the reason that we feel guilty is because we care so deeply and because parenting is so hard. But one of the things that really, um, when I was training as a, as a, 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 psychi a psychiatrist, as when I was a registrar and I was doing, oh gosh, infant mental health, I think, one of, one of, my lecturers said, I think you only have to get the parenting right about 30% of the time. And it was like, oh, thank God. What a relief. I reckon I can do 30%. I, I would sort of, I don't know where they got that number from, but I didn't question it because it suited my parent guilt. But I would say that um, it, it's about damage control, you know, peaks and troughs. You just, you just... First of all, you don't want to be a good parent. You want to be a good enough parent, okay? Being a perfect parent is a bad deal. It's a bad deal for the kid. It's a bad deal for the parent. But being a good enough parent, well, you, we sort of have a crack and you just don't get too feral. And so really, if you notice you're getting feral when the kid is distressed, you either tag team with whoever else is around and collect yourself or you just try and regulate back in using the breathing because it, it, does, it just doesn't work. And yet we all, we all get really guilty when we lose it but if we get really good at pulling it together and just going into damage control i think that's a good first step all right we've got one more um question comment um yeah. i guess some kids may be a certain age but not their behavior no and so if we've got you know some kids are going to be behind um and it could be that there's been a little bit of adversity along the way you know maybe a parent's died or there's been illness or um you know they've moved country or whatever or there's been a pandemic and someone's got sick or whatever their situation has changed um so that means that even though they're in primary school they might have a slightly preschool level of regulation no problem, just meet them where they're at. So if they're not yet ready, so with the track, reset, fix, join, it means they need more help until they catch up. I suppose the other kids that will be a bit behind is if they've got a developmental disorder such as autism, they're going to need more scaffolding for longer. They're going to need a longer childhood. So, you know, where the milestones that we set for the neurotypical kid um, they'll just be a little bit slower for the kid with with autism spectrum disorder i suppose the other one is learning learning disorders too it might slow things down so we get lots of variations on the theme and i really am talking in generalist terms at the moment all right better press on oh what's that that's the wrong thing sorry that's my <laughs> i think i've shared the wrong thing let me try again stop share I have to talk to myself, share screen, 
desktop, no. Where's Chrome gone? There we are. Beautiful. Good. Now, as we were, whoopsie. As we were, I've already said this, brains turned off. How do you talk to them? Nice face, nice music of your voice, nice body, but words don't work. Brains turned on in the social engagement system. So we really get all, moda all modalities. So we still want the sort of the soft voice, the, the soft face, soft voice, soft body language and words because now they're working and this is where the child actually learns so it's in the social engagement system that we sort of bond and that we explain and we understand we sort stuff out but in the um, survival mode system it's just be direct it be gently firmly directive get them calmed down and then you can unpack it all don't unpack it all in the middle of a storm just get out of the storm all right now I was talking about that primary school age, that middle phase of childhood being kind of an apprenticeship. And it really is an apprenticeship on welcome to your body. So as a parent of a preschooler, we've kind of learned, we've kind of learned them. You know, we know that this baby, this kind of thing settled them down, whereas that baby, this kind of thing settled them down. They're a calm child, they're a fussy child, they're a, they, they like being tickled, they hate being tickled. Like, you know, we've got a bit of a we, we've got a bit of a take on them, right? They don't. They don't have a take on their body. Their body is a mystery. They're just these little monkeys that are just sort of, you know, reactive. And so really when I'm talking about, so this is the way they learn. This is primary school. So this is that middle stage of childhood. So they'll come in kind of like, like that and we'll go, oh, you're not looking very happy. You look a bit frustrated. I wonder if you're not feeling right. So what happens is little Johnny or Johnine comes in like this, sort of feeling, feeling like this and doesn't know what this is, but, you know, they feel it. They're engulfed by the feeling. And we sort of look back and we almost mirror what, what we see, you know, almost sort of mirror the, the facial expression to show that I, I get you, I get you. And they kind of almost see us in their face. And then we go, oh, you're looking a bit annoyed or frustrated. And so really what we've done is we've put their body feeling together with this word. And so this feeling gets frustrated and they know next time they feel like that, it's I'm frustrated. So this is sort of how the apprenticeship works. So when we're trying to calm them down, I always encourage parents to calm them down out loud because um, this is where they learn and, 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 um, even though they're a bit upset when they come in later, once they've calmed down, it's like, oh, you were looking really frustrated there. I wonder what was going on for you. So we don't argue with the feeling or we don't say that's the wrong way to feel. We're sort of trying to help name it so they can start to be aware of their body and what different body states mean. And this, this is the, this forms the building blocks of self-regulation. Once you've got nameable bits, nameable feelings, you can start to think about, what did mum or dad used to do or my carer or, you know, nan or pop when I got like that? Oh, they used to do this. All right. So that is, so that, I'll just go back there because this is really important. A lot of learning happens when we connect through helping them regulate in. And really, if you can't, so take your own pulse first, calm yourself down because it's such an opportunity. If you can kind of keep you cool to be able to help your child learn about themselves and, and they learn through practice and it's through the naming and through the wondering out loud. But, you know, when kids get stressed, I used to get so triggered. And if we can just breathe it down and just sort of ground ourselves a bit and then help them regulate in, it's it's gold. It's it's very high yield. Okay. So we talked about three ways of connecting with our kids. The next one is the cuddles. And so this is where in the workbook, I wanted you to think about what, what were your ingredients of feeling protected, cared for, understood and belong. Because now we want to think about well, what works for our kids. So let's just think about protected, right? It, it's a basic one, but it's important. You've got to be safe. And so um, home, you've got to be free from bullying, free from shouting. So if there's been a lot of conflict, yep, Anna, you've got a question? No, no question, but just um, 
tracking time. We're around 38 minutes in. I forgot to let you know at the 30 minute mark because I was so hooked and thinking about my two children. <laughs> the okay, entire time yeah. I was like, whoops, it's already good. 38. So just good give it a All right. I think we I think we're gonna make it, guys, but I'm gonna keep pushing through. Okay. So um you know that to feel safe you know you've got to be physically safe you've got to be safe from bullying for instance at school at home you want home if there's lots of conflict and shouting that doesn't feel safe that kind of makes your tummy go really tight um and safe from people being rough with you okay so that, that that's what the idea of being protected would be if we're thinking about cared for, that's really fed and watered and sort of warm and, and not too hot if you're in the Kimberley and not too cold if you're here in the Macedon Ranges, feeling soothed, like someone's settled you down, they've rubbed your back, they've put you on their shoulder and given you a pat. So that's sort of cared for and cuddled. I mean, we're built for pressure. We're built for feeling held and just feeling that sort of connection. And, you know, you, lay, you basically lay your child across your heart heart don't you and you hold them to your heart and they can feel your heartbeat and you can feel their little heartbeat and it's about giving that sense of felt and lived security and the other one um, that I'm really rotten at but I think is important is a is a routine now not a whiz bang fantastics over scheduled routine but just this sense like the, that you're not floundering in chaos all the time you kind of know how things roll over and it gives that sense of knowing what to expect now, understood. Understood is, um, so I suppose I, I, you know, over the years I've worked with kids that have come from sort of neglect and they don't know themselves because no one's watched them. No one's sort of noticed them and noticed out loud and reflected it back to them. No one's explained to them what makes them tick. Like kids are a mystery to themselves and you almost explain them to them, them as you understand them out loud. And sort of be interested in them, you know, that oh, what you think and what you do is interesting. And finally, belong. Well, your face has got a smile when they walk in the room, you know. How was your day? Even if they go, no, nah, whatever, you know, when the teenagers start grunting, you still got to smile. That's your job, right? You still got to be happy to see them. And they can be all grumpy and hormonal and, and kind of adolescent, but that's their job. Peter, um, a comment that is almost a question. The way I regulate my 10-year-old is I find always giving in to him and that's not good in the long run. And now he is so spoiled. Yeah, well, giving giving in to him, uh, giving him what he's want. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a tricky one. I might try and get to, it's not that tricky. It's like giving in to him is not necessarily giving him the opportunity to learn to be disappointed and then lose it and then calm down. But if you're very calm and you're not panicked about, well, you know, we can't have lollies every day or I can't buy you the, you know, the Nintendo doozy whatever every time and then they get really upset and really disappointed. I mean, the way we can help them is just be very calm, not panicky and say, well, it's disappointing, isn't it? You know, we can't always have what we want and sometimes we've got to be patient and they'll be angry and they're whatever. Well, now it's time to calm down. And when you've calmed down, I can give you a bit of a hug and we'll, we'll you know, we'll talk about it. But it's about learning to sit with disappointment or, um, you know, and if we're seeing anger and rage, well, that's survival mode, isn't it? And so it's about breathing them down and just holding your ground and being very still and calm. And I think if, if, if they're able to sort of trigger us into action with their survival mode behaviour, it almost, um, it perpetuates it. But if we're just able to roll with it and calm and centre ourselves and just be very realistic about it, it's like, well, you know, we all get disappointed. That's okay. But now it's time to calm down. And when you're ready, I'll give you a hand. Okay. And and so really it's just just, I think that one would come back to giving in is are you getting triggered? And do we really need to work on sort of that permission system in yourself and that kind of confidence and backing yourself, you know, that no, no, look, just because he's angry and upset doesn't mean I give in. And if I'm getting quite triggered, then maybe I need to really work on just being centred and that there needs to be some consistent parenting with, you know, whoever else is in the household. Yep. And so belong is also joining in and playing together. Okay, so that's a lot, but that's important. 
Now, um, day five is talking about play, so 20 minutes a week. And this is how we uh, help build confidence in our children. And now I am aware of the time. I've got about 10 minutes to talk about this, I would say, but I reckon we can do it. I'm going to push through. Is that okay? So can I ask a yep. quick question? Yep. Um, so it's 20 minutes a week? Yes. All right. Because <laughs> I heard you say do this it. twice and I was like, wow, this is absolutely doable. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Let me explain. Okay, so we've talked about that and this is how we grow in confidence. So when I'm talking about 20 minutes a week, this is child-centered play therapy. And so it's not any play like, oh, yeah, all we'll I have to do is push you on the swings for 20 minutes a week, check my phone, everything's fine, done, tick. It's about saying we're going to have a little special time together where I, I enter your play space and I, you have my undivided attention. And it doesn't have to be the only time, but if you're feeling a bit disconnected or if you're feeling a bit, you know, that, that things can't happen, it's a lovely way to sort of build this connection. Let me explain. So there's lots of different, I'm talking about creative play here. And yes, we can have sort of swings and drawing and we can have building things in the sand. And th they're all sort of a form of creative play. And so I want to first think about the play space and how we play and then what we do. So when, when we enter a child's play space, because I sort of, I don't know, no one ever played with me. And so um, I found playing with kids really boring. I don't now, but I used to. And no one ever kind of played with me. There was always stuff going on. And so we were either left to our own de devices. So I actually didn't even have a template. But when we think about a child's play, there's a couple of there's a couple of the ideas that I want to share with you. The first is that 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 a child's play, it's their game. And so we're not there to teach them or instruct them. We're not there to take over. It's like we're a guest in their house. So if we we're invited to someone's house, we wouldn't sort of take over the dinner and tell them that they're wrong. We'd, we'd be a guest and we'd listen and attend and, and sort of you know, um, be respectful. And so when we do this play in a child's play space, we have to be respectful. It's their house, it's their playhouse, and, and we're there to be a big fan, which means we turn our phone off. We wouldn't sit in the guest, we wouldn't, you know, and um, we don't teach them or correct them or edit. Yeah? Peter, so, one more question. Is this yeah? 20 minutes each child or can it be all together? Each child. They need their one-to-one -one special time. They really do, because it's how you get to know them. And so um, how does that build confidence? Well, it builds confidence um, because when they're playing and you're there, they're kind of telling a story. And usually they're the hero of the story, either Bank Crash Wallop or they're the artist in residence or they're the amazing sports star. And so they get to be a hero of their own movie. But the best bit is that the, they get to be hero in, in front of the most important person in the world, and that's you. They get to shine, right? So in terms of building confidence, if you're there and if you're really kind of tuning into what they're doing and just appreciative of it, they're shining. It's really good for kids to shine and for you to see them shine. Now, sometimes it's bang, crash, wallop, or it's play that you don't like. Um, and, you know, like a lot often when I sit down with kids and, you know, like they're kind of murdering people and <laughs> knifing them to death. But this is an adventure story that they're, they're telling. It's not them. It doesn't mean they're going to be a psychopath, you know. It's just like, you know, you turn on any show on TV and it's all violence and kind of awful. So, you know, if they're telling this dramatic story, they're telling a story about their fears and, or they're telling an action adventure. So we're there to watch and understand where their head's at and not get all paranoid and think that they're kind of, you know, psychopaths because fear is part of a child's life. And so when we sort of see where their head's at and we see the little person there, we can kind of remember, instead of just being busy multitasking, the bane of um, all of our lives, I would like to think, um, we get to see this little person trying to make sense of the world. 
And we, we see where their head's at because we follow their story. So if you think about it, if you decide to have a potter or a play or something like that, you start off by having a bit of fun and you tell a bit of a story and then it gets to the hard bit. And then that's the problem. And then you have to be a bigger person or you have to solve the problem or you have to have superpowers. And that's how you make it better. And this is sort of the learning bit. This is where kids figure stuff out. And it's where we as grown-ups figure stuff out. And then you win, <laughs> right? You're the best. And so the child's sitting there working stuff out through this representational play and you're not allowed to sit there and get paranoid, right, and sort of they're just playing and we watch and we understand them better. It's like, oh, you're dealing with this at the moment. Oh, you're interested in that at the moment. You know, we might not share the interest, but we can show respect. And so really our job is to be the voiceover or the narrator. That shows that we're actually watching. And, and it also helps them understand what they're saying. It's like, oh, so he's trying to climb the mountain. It's getting really hard. Wow. And oh, so then the monster's coming. Oh, sounds scary. Don't like the sound of that. I hope he's going to be all right. And so as we're kind of narrating the story, um, we're sort of narrating the problem and how, how maybe the, this person in the play story is feeling and how they work out how to make it better or not. I mean, sometimes it's just bang, crash, wallop and they're smashing cars together and that's fun. It's like, oh, it looks like it's fun smashing those cars together. I reckon they're getting all smashed up. And so, but at the same time, we can reflect on, you know, maybe this is sort of reflecting how they're feeling at the moment, or maybe they're just having fun smashing cars. But as we sort of connect and enter their world, you know, they become alive to us and we become alive. They kind of, it's lovely to be known. It's lovely that people are interested in you. So this 20 minutes a week does make a difference because it's that connection of, of, you know, we're not teaching them table manners. We're just listening and we're understanding. We're letting them roll. And so here's the pricey of it here. And this is how we do it. It's the, first of all, take your own pulse first. So you've got to be calm, have your phone off and sort of be ready to focus. It's got to be your special time. The mm. next thing is that you need to help the child get going. So usually it's nice to set up, you know, have your little special place or a special time or special activity, but it's child led. And so it's watch with interest as they sort of get going. They might start here and start there and take a bit of time to warm up, just like we do when we start pottering, but then they get into it. And so you just use your quiet voice to say, oh, yeah, that looks good. Oh, what about this? Oh, yeah. And we're just trying to help them get going, but we're not interfering. We're not doing it for them. We're not doing it with them, per se. We're supporting them do it and get, and get in a rhythm. And then we sort of want to help keep them going and just sort of facilitate them have that kind of play. And as we do it, again, be the narrator, comment with interest, and then tell a great story about it. So if it actually did have a narrative arc, so it was actually a little adventure that they played, you can say, well, that was interesting, wasn't it? it looked like this and that, and he was worried about that, and then it all sorted out in the end. Or, gosh, you've made these beautiful things, you know, look at the flowers and it's got all the detail and, and you know, that must make you very happy sort of doing such lovely drawings, whatever. It, it's that we're showing that we're attending and we're sort of, we're doing this lovely commentary to show that we're connecting with what they're offering up to the world in their beautiful, innocent, confused, kind of pigeon-toed kind of a way. And so really 20 minutes a week and it, it, it does build and it is their special time. Now, we do this with quite stressed kids and um, we'll find that in the initial phase, it's quite bang, crash, wallop and disorganized, or it might be, you know, a lot of lying down and just sort of hiding and things like that. So quite a regressed game, young for their age. But as they get to enjoy and inhabit their place base, things get worked out and they kind of get happier and it gets more organized. So that that's in the in the therapy context. Don't you worry about that. This is just in the, having this lovely connection moment in, in the house where it's not about chores, it's not about jobs, it's not about learning, it's not about readers, it's about play and being together and being, being a guest in their house and being a lovely, supportive, appreciative guest where they get to shine. Now, I think I'll stop.
Yep. Can I quickly interrupt? There's one question and also keeping you tr on track of time. It's yes. um, we've got around seven minutes left for today. And I've got one question. Um, is this yep. 20 minute play working for older kids teens? How to play with them? Ah, yes. Well, uh, well. coming up. <laughs> uh, no, look, I'll just talk about that because I've thrown, I sh I've, you know, I could go on for hours because, you know, it's what I do, right? But let's think about teens. So first of all, teens want to show us that uh, they don't care, <laughs> that we're really boring. But really, they, they, they want us to be interested in them, even if they want to tell us that we're real dags, right? You know, and so um, it, it's about it's, it can be a bit hard to catch that moment and they won't necessarily want to do it as their thing. And often we've got to work a bit harder to meet them where they are. And especially if they're infuriating us, like the take your own pulse first kind of bit with teens is really hard. Um, and so if they're animated about something, like we in our household, we're having an awful lot of discussions about K-pop and I don't like K-pop, but I'm interested. <laughs> I'm interested. I've got my favourite. And um, because it's sharing their world and, you know, they're latching onto this or they're latching onto that because it's meaningful to them. And so if we actually get this, this moment where they're expanding and they're not grunting and kind of ignoring us, connect with it. And it's about showing interest. So so it, it might not be play so much. It might be... Um, you know, conversation, but it's, again, go, going into their world and their interest. And I guess we play in our imagination. Now, that doesn't have to be the only way. It can, it can also be that there might be some activities that you actually enjoy together. Um, so if you've got a very grumpy um, daughter or son, <laughs> there might actually be some high yield activities that you both actually like so you can tolerate being with each other you know whether it's going and doing a yoga class together or just going shopping it's enjoying it's fun shopping for this or going and watching watching them play sport and then you know asking about the game and what do you reckon and what do you think just 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 meet but it, the whole idea of play is meeting them where they're at and being interested in what they're doing and just again not not teaching not correcting just to sort of uh, supporting their world and their understanding a, a very good place to do it is often in the car like I know with my son I would have more exchange of of high value information driving him to the train station <laughs> than the whole weekend when he'd been watching YouTube or you know whatever up all night on on um, steam or you know one of the or discord playing games you know nothing common there but on the way to the on the way driving into the train station when i'm sitting there and there's no eye contact and he's sitting there and nicely distracted suddenly you get this expansive moment in the car and go with it it's about again being interested in what they have to say and just sort of creating that space to connect yeah any other questions? Because, yes, I'm noting the time. No questions so far, but I've got a question. So um, you've referred to multitasking and um, different age group kids. And I have a toddler and I have a primary school kid, age kid, and I feel like I'm multitasking just between managing their behaviours constantly, like yes, being, yeah. you know, supporting the apprentice and then having a very fierce um, toddler that needs to stand his ground um, constantly. Um, yeah. How do I manage between, you know, constantly switching as a parent? Have you got? Um... Well, I, th I think at first of all, not setting your setting your standards too high. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. already failing. You know, <laughs> you know, you know how the, your toddler, their brains like that big, you know, and they're just going to scream and carry on like a pork chop. And it, it just, they've just got to grow out of it. And it's exasperating. It's exasperating, right? It's so triggering. It's so raw. You, you can't be perfect. You just got to roll with it and have some pretty mediocre standards. Yeah. <laughs> or just be consistent and loving and just try and bring your own stress down. So number one, take the pressure off because like toddlers are so stressful. And, you know, if you've got a bit of a tag team, you know, when you're really like, oh, cooked, um, use it 
Yeah. With with a primary school kid, like you got six years to get it right. So don't again take the pressure. Off, you know? <laughs> yeah. You got six years, right? Yeah. And if you're sort of nice and and kind of you just you, it just doesn't have to be perfect in every interaction. It's just got to be kind of okay. And like you're a big fan, you know, you love them. And so there's this whole thing and school can perpetuate it a bit. Like if I don't do my reader every night, I'm going to fail HSC or VCE, you know. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're in yeah. prep, yeah. but if you don't yeah. do it, you're going to get behind. <laughs> it's like, no, nah. like, come on. And by the time they get to year 12, they would have changed the school system anyway. If you've got a bright, interested, happy kid, and they do have ups and downs, like just take the pressure off because they learn so much from play. They learn so much from sport. They learn so much from being creative. And yes, they learn from school too. And that, you know, if you're a decent human being with a, they learn from you because you're a decent human being. <laughs> well, no, I, I'm only half decent. But that's pretty good. And, uh, you know, a couple like, of um, comments before because I'm mindful of the time. Yeah. Um, it is so I've got one person saying it is a struggle to give them one on one. My girls are two, three and four. You're already a hero to me. And if I try to give one of them a long time with me, the others are upset and trying to get involved. I can relate to that even with two. Um, yeah. and you, might, then, you might need yeah. backup and you might need to get out of the house. Mm -hmm. And, and the maybe, house. maybe your play is a creative, like, like, I mean, I know no one could with COVID, but, you know, we're grateful for small mercies now, aren't we? You can actually get out of the house. But... Um, you know, it, it might be that, you know, sometimes you can do it as a job lot and you, you sit down and there's a lovely game and you're appreciating both. But really with two, three and four, there's going to be a lot of competition. I mean, it's fun to kind of just all muck in and do stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're wanting to sort of just give them a little bit of them time with you, where remember, they want to be the star of the show and you're the narrator and you're the audience like how wonderful <laughs> you know and so you know maybe you head off to the park or you and but it's a game that they play there or they're in the sandpit or you just you just you know or the the your partner if there's a partner around that that they get to you know you just sort of juggle it and it doesn't like don't beat yourself up like the reason we say 20 minutes which has come from child-centered play therapy and so you know when you've got a healthy when you've got kids who are kind of tracking okay you don't need to right it's not like extra homework you have to do but if you've got really rotten parent guilt and um you you want to do something that you know is going to be good you do 20 minutes it's like yeah. And I think that's a good way to finish off. Um, I've, I've got a youth work background, so I can relate to the car conversations. I think um, the best conversation I had with young people were in the car and someone commented on the 120 hours of driving lessons um, for their kids. So Dita, this was really engaging. I was very absorbed in your presentation and could relate to so much and had my giggles in between um, as well because it just resonated. Everything's re resonated with me. Um, how can people get more of you? Oh, okay. Um, well, yes. Um, tracking better website. So you just, I'll have to put a... Um, an email you can just sort of register for a list uh, oh god on the breathing page i'll put a little email catcher because i'm going to do some courses next year on sort of guided imagery and goal setting and just self you want us to send something out to everyone if, if people want i'm happy to send out yep. just a, a link we'll do that then, um next year once i've put the courses together you're welcome to come along also we've really bolted through a heck of a lot of material in this week um it would be nice i'm going to put out some courses where we go through it really slowly we actually have breakout groups and talk and discuss because i've just gone like the clappers so um yeah i i might send a link out and then people will send a link maybe with the video recordings um that are yeah, going out which yeah, is yeah. 
good um, transition. So we are, have recorded this session, so the video will go out to everyone. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you so much, Dita. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was another great session, I think. Um, also, if you would like to know more about Mary Health, you can check out our website um, and we will be sending out both links and to those people that haven't received the activity book, we will be sending that out as well. So finish off on Dieter's words, let's take good care of ourselves. And I think, don't forget the 20 minutes, I think we can do this as, as parents. <laughs> I feel empowered and it can be done. Um, so we'll give it a shot this weekend, I think. <laughs> Thank I have to remember to too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two <three> times. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. See ya. Bye. Take Bye. care and have a great Christmas. <laughs>